my brother and sister. I had to sharpen my sword on that for a moment. This heat's still going on. Not blaming on the heat, but the sharpness of my sword. I was talking about the order of the foundation. So it's order. It's order. Will. Right? Wisdom. Wisdom. That's the yellow right there. We had to think about the color for a moment. The yellow. Wisdom. And then the green is righteousness. So we're going to learn right here, well, what is the order? What is the order of this red heifer? You understand? What is the order of the red heifer? Now, on the footnote for Numbers chapter 19, as we were reading, the order is this, right, which is the foundation. We went off on the point of order in the last part. You overstand to a certain point, and then after we said order will, I was thinking, we kept thinking righteousness, righteousness, but there's that wisdom. The wisdom is the key. Wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal matter. So it's one thing to have knowledge, but to have wisdom and understanding, or as Aina Rastafari say, overstanding is the key thing. That overstanding is that righteousness. You know, saying the overstanding is that righteousness. You can look at it in the three bands or the four. You understand the four of the seven, and that fourth one is the heart chakra. That green is the heart chakra. That righteousness, that overstanding, overstanding in heart. But the foundation is order, so the order is this. I'm going to go over the order of this red heifer, the type of Christ, of the sacrifice of the Moshiach, as that ground, that ground, that para aduma, para aduma which is the red heifer, but the aduma, right, the aduma is that ground. The aduma as the adama is that earth, from that earth. You understand, so that man was made from that earth. And if we look at that natural red earth and even the red type of ancient Egyptian, the racial type, we can see the connection right there and the humanity, in other words, of Christ. So the order is this. Firstly is the slaying of the sacrifice. So the first thing is the slaying of this sacrifice. The red heifer is that sacrifice there. Secondly is the sevenfold, the sevenfold sprinkling of the blood. And blood is a symbol, symbolic of life. If you look at, um, what is it, uh, John's Gospel, John chapter 6, he talks about the flesh and the blood and eating his flesh and blood, but then he explains right there in that chapter that it's his word. He's speaking about the word and the spirit. The word and the spirit is what we have to eat, what we have to partake of right there. So the blood is not, it's a type. The blood is a type. So that is now overstanding it. That's the metaphysical of it, the sevenfold sprinkling of the blood or of the life which is typical public testimony, which is typical public testimony before the eyes of all, of the complete and never, the complete and never to be repeated, putting away of all the mitmanans, all of those who have amen, their sin, their chatiyat, as before ha Elohim as before the triune God. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 12 to 14. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 to 12. Now, thirdly, it's the reduction, the reduction of, of the sacrifice to ashes. So the sacrifice now, this red heifer, is brought down to ashes. Mm -hmm. The red heifer is brought down to ashes, is reduced to ashes, which are preserved, and they become a metasebia. They become a memorial, a remembrance, a metasebia of the sacrifice. There's a memorial of the sacrifice. So when we now look at Fasika or Pesach, you know what I'm saying? When we look at what's called the Last Supper or the Lord's, the Lord's Table, our Black Lord's Table, when we look at even our Agape or our Aita Love Feast, it is that same memorial. So our gathering together, our machiber, you know, our gathering together to sup, which is what happens at the pilgrim, 
the pilgrimage festivals. You understand? When we gather together for that metasebia, for that remembrance, that memorial. It's like the Shabbat. It's like the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a memorial as well. It says to, to remember, you understand, the Sabbath and to keep it holy or to keep it set apart, to keep it separate. You understand? So we have the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, as well as the annual Sabbath, right? So now for the ashes of the red heifer, right, they are preserved and they become a memorial of the sacrifice itself. When Christ says, as, lo as often as you do this, you do this in what remembrance, right, in remembrance of me. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like we'll, we say that the, the ancients is the lamb's bread. We have to remember to do it in what remembrance, you know what I'm saying, as a memorial of him. So it's really in what sort of mind, in what sort of order, what sort of mind, will, and what sort of wisdom, and what sort of righteousness, you know what I'm saying? And therefore, it must be in him and through him, to him and through him are all things. Verse 4, it says that, the, sprink, the, 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 cleansing of, the cleansing from defilement, right? There's a cleansing. There must be a cleansing from defilement. Now, remember the overstanding of this, according to the footnote, the reference right here, is that it's a type. And I, I try to explain it's like a, a, a hieroglyphic type. It's not just so-called the letter, but it's what the letter is symbolic of. You know what I'm saying? What the letter, you know, what is embedded in that particular um, hieroglyph? What's embedded in that particular type? You know what I'm saying? And now we have the order right here. And now the fourth aspect is the cleansing from defilement. The cleansing. How do we cleanse ourselves in this pilgrimage walk of Rastafari, in this pilgrimage walk of Christ, being in the world but not of the world? How do we cleanse ourselves? from the often defilement because we're still in this world which is defiled. Now, the cleansing from defilement, hat yat, or sin, has two aspects. And this is very, very important. I was thinking a couple of days ago, even when I did the Abba Love um, vid and everything, the sermon there, I was thinking how to explain this, you know, the whole precepts of, of, of Christ. You know what I'm saying? But for I and I, as Rastafari in this time, in order for I and I to be in keeping, you know, with the will, you understand, of I and I father, of Abba Kedus, of Kedus Abatachin. And now here I'm seeing that now we have a, 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 an example right here because sin, chatiyat, missing that mark of, 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 of that conformity to Christ, you understand, um, that sin, it has two aspects. What are the two aspects of chatiyat, of sin? One is guilt, and secondly is uncleanness. The first one is guilt. You know what I'm saying? When we recognize that we've fallen short, or we, excuse me, did something that we should not have done, there's that guilt there. You know what I'm saying? There's that guilt. And his Matthew speaks in, in, in his speech on religion about the guilty conscience. Mm hmm And I think that his majesty's um, teaching right here needs to be brought into, um, if we have it over here, it needs to be brought into reference right here where his majesty is speaking now about that one who has a, has a guilty conscience is never, ever free until he makes peace. How does he make peace? And how his majesty teaches on that, and he points to Christ. And he points to Christ's cross when he speaks on that. And his speech on, no doubt you recall, I think we might have in the other, in the other wing of the gates, where his majesty speaks on religion. Okay, here we have it right here. Where his majesty speaks on, in this document right here, where his imperial majesty speaks on religion. Because sin now has two aspects. You know what I'm saying? What is sin? Chat yat is missing the mark. You know what I'm saying? It's not being aligned. It's not, it's, it's not hitting that mark. It's like falling short, right? And when his majesty speaks on religion, he goes into some, into some details on this. And I, I, I think we put it in this document right here. 
because it explains so much to I and I and I and I walk and directly it is the teaching of His Majesty. That's the key thing about it. Directly it's the teaching of His Imperial Majesty where His Majesty speaks on that one who um, has a guilty conscience is never free until he makes peace with that con or in that consciousness and then he points out how Christ is that peace for I and I consciousness which is which is such a beautiful way of 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 summarizing something that is so very important to us in our walk and many of us I think we might read this but we we miss the mark in other words we we miss hitting it you might get close to it, but we don't hit the bullseye. You know the whole thing about hitting the bullseye. So this red heifer um, sacrifice is a way to help Beit Israel, in a sense, to hit the bullseye. You know what I'm saying? And the word and the teaching of His Majesty and the testimony of Christ is also, that in that spiritual sense, is the way to help and make sure that we hit that bullseye and we don't fall short of the mark. Here he's saying, his master saying, knowing that material and spiritual progress are essential to man, we must ceaselessly work for the equal attainment of both. Only then shall we be able to acquire that absolute inner calm. Acquiring that absolute inner calm, so necessary to our well-being. Whenever conflict arises between material and spiritual values, the conscience plays an important role. And anyone who suffers from a guilty conscious, conscience is never really free, is never really free from this problem until he makes peace with himself and his conscience. It's like to make peace with yourself and with Christ. Your peace of yourself and with God because we are made in the image and after the likeness of the triune God. So we have spirit, soul, and body. Ab, Wallet, Memphis, Caduce. We have to make peace with God. And the only peace, the true peace, is in and through our black Lord and Savior, Shua HaMoshiach. And his perfect one time, never to be repeated again, sacrifice for I and I. Some folks don't get it, you understand, but His Majesty gives them a hint. He says, discipline of the mind is a basic ingredient of genuine morality. Not morality because, okay, now is, is PC time, so everybody being PC, but nothing really changed in their hearts and their minds, but His Majesty teaches that discipline of the mind is a basic ingredient of genuine morality and therefore of spiritual strength. Spiritual power is the eternal guide in this life and the life after. For man ranks supreme among all creatures. Led forward by spiritual power, man can reach the great, the summit destined for him by the great creator. He goes on to state, right, he goes on to state, and here's where, here's where he makes that connection with Christ. He says, however wise or however mighty a person may be, he is like a ship without a rudder if he is without God, if he is without Jah, if he is without the true and living God. A rudderless ship is at the mercy of the waves and the wind, drifts wherever they take it, and if there arises a whirlwind like a storm in our lives, it is smashed against the rocks and becomes as if it has never existed. It is our firm belief or our firm imnet or amen or hymenot that a soul, a soul, remember this whole red heifer matter here in this Torah portion, Numbers chapter 19, how it speaks about one who is not clean, their soul is cut off from Beta Israel, their soul is cut off from the congregation of Israel, what does His Majesty Kedusa Abba Abba Kedus, what does He teach us? It is I and I, our firm belief or our main or faith, the true faith, the right faith, 
the Ritta Hymenos, that a soul without Christos, a soul without Hamoshiach, is bound to meet with no better fate. In other words, smash against the rock, carried wherever the forces of the world. That's what I mean, we're in the world, but we are not of the world. The love shown by our God, by Amlakachin, by Eloheinu, to mankind should constrain all of us. That's what constrains all of us, brings us into order and discipline, discipline of the mind, should constrain all of us who are followers, who are followers. Yes, I and I are followers and disciples of Christ, even Christ in his kingly character without apology. You understand? Some people will have a problem with that, but I'm sure they have a problem for a lot of other things. It's time for them to humble and stop grumble. Followers and disciples of Christ to do all in our power to see to it that the message of salvation, the good news of his majesty, the message of salvation, which is Yeshua HaMoshiach, Getachin Yesus Christos, his word in spirit and in truth, is carried to those of our fellows who have not had the benefit of hearing of hearing, it has to begin with hearing, of hearing the what? Of hearing the good news, of hearing the gospel of the King of Kings and his Christ, the pure gospel of Christ in his kingly character. All right? All right. So we thought that was important there to point out that sin now, hatiyat, it has two aspects. It has, it has guilt, and then it has the uncleanness. You know, in the uncleanness. By sprinkling with the ashes mingled with water. Now, this cleansing from defilement is by sprinkling with the ashes mingled with water. Now, water, wuha, we say wuha, right, or maya, if we go to the gutters, right, but wuha or wuha, right, wuha, Water is a type of both the spirit and the word. We've got to underline that right there. Those who have a Schofield um, Bible, um, a hard copy, those who have downloaded the other copy, write this down. Write this verse down on page 192 where it says, Water is a type of both the spirit and the word. Water is a type. Remember we're speaking about type, like a hieroglyphic type? Water is a type of what? The spirit and the word. What's interesting, if you look at the, um, the ancient um, hieroglyphs and the ancient glyphs of, of, of humanity's writing, water looks like this. Water looks like that, like a mountain. Water look, look, looks like that wave. You understand that wave? Or you might be able to do it like this. Water looks like that wave. You understand that wave right there, water. We look at the Ethiopic letter for, for meh. It looks like meh right there. Meh, right? The Maya, right? The Maya, Maya, Maya right there. You see that wave form. So water is what? It's a type. A type of what? Both the spirit, right? Both the spirit and the word. So the spirit and the word. Its type is water because water is a half spiritual element. What is water? Water is H2O. They say H2O, right? Um, what two parts? What hydrogen? One part oxygen. You understand the oxygen, the air, the spiritus. You understand the you can say the menfes, the stinfos, you know, and then we have ness, that connection right there. So water now, water is a type of both the spirit and the word. So in water we have the two truths. What's known as the two truths. Some in ancient Egypt was known as ma'at. The ma'at. The two truths. You understand? So water both being a type of what spirit and the word. Now in that chapter that refers you to John chapter 6 when Christ is speaking about his flesh and he's speaking about his blood it's interesting that he comes down to the word you know he comes down to spirit. He says, this is spirit. You understand? They are spirit. And then he adds, that it is life. So the word is spirit and it's life. So the water is both the spirit 
is a type of both the Spirit and the Word. John chapter 7, verse 37 to ver verse 39, and Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Chapter 5, I'm curious about that one right there. Chapter 5, um, verse um, 26, because Hawadi Apollos, he uses a wonderful expression. You understand? A wonderful expression to describe it. And I think it's right here. He says, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might sanctify, make it holy, make it set apart, and cleanse it, by, cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, with the washing of water by the word. And it's interesting how that connects with husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it in verse 25 and verse 26 of Ephesians chapter 5. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So that connection right there with the water and with the word, you know what I'm saying, is, 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 is a very important key to understand. Now, in ancient Egypt, this can be read from the types. This can be read from the monuments. That's if one overstands and comprehends. If you're just looking at the outer form, you know what I'm saying, and not, and not in form or in formation, you cannot understand what it's really saying, and the same is true with the scriptures. That's why there's a lot of, you know, crazy kind of interpretations of the Bible that has nothing to do with the, the inner narrative or the inner element or the historical context, all right? So then the operation typified is this. There's a certain operation. There's a certain oper there's a mechanics of this. There's an M.O., right, to this. And it is that the Holy Spirit, the menfes caduce, the ruach, Hakodesh in the Hebrew. It uses the word or the debar, the devar, the devar, right, in the Hebrew. It uses the word or the kal, bamarinya, and the good is to convict the mitmanan. See, the word is used to convict you. So when you hear the word, that's why a lot of folks don't like the Bible, because they hear things in the Bible and it's convicting them. So they say, forget about the Bible. I don't believe that. That's a fairy tale. But whenever they hear it, it convicts them. You understand? But because it's not mitmanon, they run away from it. But the word convicts the mitmanon of some kufu, of some evil, some kufu, right, that was allowed, that we allowed in our life. You understand? That we, that we allow into our life to hinder. And so we thought was very incredible, not, not incredible, I don't want to use that word. Incredible means it's not believable, it's not acceptable as, as having truth to it. We don't want to use that word. But here's what is so, in a sense, uh, 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 wonderful. What is so wonderful from our wonderful counselor and his word is that the Holy Spirit uses the word to convict the mitmanan, the one who have amen, of some kufu allowed in his or her life, right, into his or her life to hinder, uh, to the hindering, to preventing of his or her joy, growth, and service. Joy, growth, and service. Write that down. Joy, growth, and service. So the word now, the Holy Spirit, is using the word to convict the mitmanon. You right? Those of us who have amen. You know, and who have amen in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the triune God. Those of us who have amen. We hear the word, and when we study the word, even I and I, we, we read some things that make us think about ourselves. You know what I'm saying? I mean, on, on various different levels. You know, that's what it means. It convicts. It convicts us as the mitmanon of some kufu, something that is unkind or evil that we have allowed. We might think it just showed up or it's just there, but we allow it. You know what I'm saying? We give it permission. In that sense, we allow this evil into our life. And then by allowing that, we wonder why we can't be as joyful, even in tribulation, or why we can't grow, 
or why we can't serve in, 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 in the work of Jah, the real work of Jah. You know what I'm saying? Why is that? Because we have allowed some kufu, something. You know what I'm saying? And if we spend time in prayer and meditation, we'll find it out. And if we trust in Jah and in his word, we will have the strength to overcome it so that we can once again have that true joy, that desita. We can have that growth. We will grow up to him. We won't be immature, so-called Christian, or immature Rastafari or, or Rastas, not immature ones, but we can be mature ones. Right? And then we can serve. So you see the threefold, the triune God is manifesting himself even right there. Joy, growth, and service. Joy, growth, and service. See, see I think the first one is so key. Because the first one you can't really fake. You can't fake joy. You know, you can't really like, ha <laughs> ha, you know, but it's not, you don't, you know, if you, when you really feel joy, you feel joy. You know it. You understand? I mean, it's, it's like no other drug or any kind of thing. This is, might be why so many people are on sorceries and pharmaceuticals and everything else because they, don't, they can't feel that joy. It's like where did that joy go? Really, it is how much evil, kufu, they have allowed into their life and how much they have prevented John's word and crystal. So it says Christ, is, he stands at the door and he knocks. If anyone will open the door and let them in, he will come in. But no, they keep him out. Now, I don't want to hear about John. I don't want to hear about the Bible. No, that's that religious stuff. I don't want to hear about that. But then they wonder, well, where did my joy go? And they have to run after pharmaceuticals or pharmacesis or whatnot or do some other kind of nonsense, and then it gets worse. There still is no joy, and then there is no growth. You understand? Know Spiritual growth. And definitely, if the first two are not there, you can't have the third one, which is service. It's like one say, well, Ross, what can I and I do? The first thing you can do is have joy in John, grow in his word. You understand? Know grow in his word. You understand? Know and then that will mature one for the service, and one will be able to recognize what their calling is. You understand? Know with a clear conscience. You understand? Know with a clear and an unadulterated consciousness. Thus convicted. Now, when we get convicted, because this happens, we're reading, we're studying, we, we find something there, or, something, or we hear someone preach or bring something forward and it bothers us. We don't agree with it, but we're convicted. You understand? Know he remembers that the guilt of his sin, you see, that's, that's the thing that Satan uses, is that guilt. More times, the guilt is ten times or a hundred times seemingly worse than whatever the act usually was. It's that guilt of that chatiyat, right, has been met by the sacrifice of Yeshua. You know what I'm Because the sacrifice of Yeshua, it, it, it swallows up all of these older types. It fully expresses. He says, I did not come to, to destroy the law all the prophets, but to do what? To fulfill it. You know what I'm saying? To fulfill it. So the sacrifice of Christos, of HaMoshiach, it fulfills that. Let's go to 1 John 1 and 7 for a moment. Let's go to 1 John 1 and 7. Because in 1 John, the epistle of John, not the gospel of John, right? 1 John um, 1 and 7, what does it say to us right here? It says... Um, it says, uh, 1 John 1 and 7 says, But if we walk, if we walk, even in this pilgrim walk through this wicked, evil Babylon world and this, and this end times world, but if we walk in the light, if we walk in the true illumination, the Barhan and Salam, as he is in the light, as he is in the illumination, he is, Yeshua is, our black Lord and Savior is the true Illuminati. I and I have what? Fellowship. We have fellowship, right? One with another. Because if we walk in, that, in, the, in the light of his word, the illumination of his word, you understand? Each of us, you understand, individually, then collectively, we are walking one with another in fellowship and in the what? The blood, the life force, you understand? The metaphysical life force of the blood of Yeshua HaMoshiach, of Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ. His Son cleanseth, cleanseth, right, us, I and I, from all chatiyat. 
And remember, the hot yad has two aspects. It has the guilt aspect, right, the guilty conscience, right, that his majesty speaks about until one makes peace with himself and his conscience. Christ is the one that makes that peace, you know what I'm saying, with ourself and with our consciousness, you know what I'm saying, our conscience, in other words, right? So it is Christ's sacrifice that, therefore, it meets all that is necessary to, 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 to perish or destroy that sin from our consciousness and restore to us a new consciousness. And that is all our right, our, uh, the free gift of God in grace, in Yeshua HaMoshiach, to all of our night. But it's based on our Amen. You, you know, it's based on the Amen. If you can't admit it, if you can't accept it, if you can't admit that it's true, to even have that doubt... You see what I'm saying? That doubt, when you think about all the stuff that we so-called be naive in the world, and we have no knowledge, no, no certainty about it, we just go along because the next person, we're in fellowship with the world. That means you'll be born again come out of the world. You're still in the world, but you're not of that mind state of the world. But with brothers and sisters, you know what I'm saying, in the true faith, you are in fellowship because you are walking in the light, the illumination of his word, and that's clearing I and I pass. So instead, therefore, of despairing, instead of despairing, because there's a lot of ones and ones out there, you know, when they think about, oh, how righteous, or they might think that they have to do things to be righteous, they're not really fully either overstanding what Christ has said, or somebody has mistold them or, or, or did not tell them exactly what the word means, you understand, in relation that Yeshua is our righteousness. In faith and accepting the Christ of his majesty, the word, the spirit, and the truth, we are now in that. It's not of ourselves. You understand, it's not of what we do. You understand, it's because of our faith in him. He becometh our righteousness before the Father. And now we have access with a caduce, Abad, with a holy Father, with a holy God. You understand the true patriarch. You understand not this false patriarch that the world for the last, you say, six thousand or so years. You understand the false patriarch, the the Cain. You understand that Cain type. What what Christ told them: "Ye of your father, the devil. He's a murderer from the beginning. But if you love me and my father, so he's distinguishing his father is holy. Our father who art in heaven." You understand? Abino Shabbat Shemayim. Right? Now, here it says, instead, therefore, of despairing, the convicted mitmanon. So, if I'm a mitmanon, if I accept, if I have faith, if I'm, if I'm a true, um, as a believer, but a mitmanon, and I have faith, I could be convicted? Yes, we all are. But instead of despairing, the convicted mitmanon judges. But we have to judge and judge righteously according to his ma'at, right? Judges and confesses, confesses the defiling thing as unworthy of a kudus, as unworthy of one who is set apart to him. It's like the Nazarite vow. When a man or woman shall vow the vow of a Nazarite, he shall be holy. He shall be a saint. He shall be caduced. Not in the way the world says a saint, but in the way that John's word and his testimony defines a caduce. It defines what a caduce is. So we have to judge it. We have to confess it. You understand? That whatever that defiling thing, you understand, person, place, or thing, you understand, is, you understand, that is unworthy. That does not meet up to his, his standards. Like it said, if any man love mother, father, sister, brother more than me, he is not worthy to be my disciple. He's not worthy of me. You understand, because we can have no other God before him. You understand, why? Because to have any other one before him was going backward. You understand, it's going astray. You understand? It's keeping us in that despair, in that lack of joy, in that lack of growth, in that lack of service and loss. So therefore, instead of despairing, the convicted mitmanon must judge. You understand? I must judge righteously. You understand? And confess. You understand? That means and recognize. And not just go and just tell folks about it. You can if you have true spiritual brothers and sisters. But the main thing is in prayer before him and within your own consciousness. It's like when they say, if someone has a problem, 
They can't get help until they recognize that they have a problem. But in, in order to come to that point of recognition, it's a very personal thing. You understand? So that mitmanon has to judge and confess the defiling thing as being unworthy of what they are, and that is a caduceus of the caduceus, a holy one, a, a son or a daughter, a brother or a sister or a mother. You understand? To our Father, His Father, the Father of our Black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. And thus, He is forgiven. He is forgiven now. You know, that is let go. You understand? Because it's whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Whatever you tie on earth will be tied in heaven. But now, once He recognizes that He is forgiven and He is cleansed, then it gives us some, some closing scriptures right here from John chapter 13, 3 to 10, as well as 1 John chapter, same place we was at, 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 to 10, concerning this aspect of the red heifer. And we did not even get into Egypt, really. I mean, we, we just barely just touched on the surface of this because it's so very interesting how this connects and this further will bring to light the identity of Miriam. You understand? And it was, when you think about Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron, I mean, even Aaron, too, you have to ask yourself, what was their problem? You know, with Moses, with his Ethiopian wife. And as you get into more of the details of it, it will become very much more clear. And then even how that connects with the water from a rock and the fact that there was no water, you understand, after Miriam's death, the people lacked water. So we have John chapter 13, verses 3 to 10. Let's go to John chapter 13, verses uh, 3 to 10. So in John chapter 13, verses 3 to, verses 3 to 10, it says, Yeshua, knowing that the Father hath given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel therewith he was girded. Therefore cometh he to Simeon Peter, and Peter Petros saith to him, Gita, dost thou wash my feet? Yeshua answered and said to him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Petro saith to him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Yeshua answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part in me. Thou hast no part in, no part with me. Simon Peter saith to him, Lord, Adonai, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Yeshua saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. Y'all are clean, but not all of y'all. Now, even that right there is often interpreted in... um. In one way, usually people say, well, he's talking about, he's talking about um, Askarotawi. He's talking about Iscariot or Judas. He's speaking about Judas is that one right there. But it also can be interpreted in the, in the sense of the verse right there that he that has washed from morning, you understand, that, that all of you are clean. He, well, he says, all of you are, what does it say right here? He says, um, but, but it's clean, but it's clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. So one who has washed is clean. He's talking about the individual. There's still that aspect that needs to be cleansed. But in the situational sense of the situation, yes, you can get the interpretation that he's speaking of askarotawi. You understand? But on the, the individual level, we have in our 12 powers, the 12 powers within man, like the 12 disciples, like the 12 tribes, like the 12, the 12 attributes or aspects, we have our Judas or Iscariot aspect that we need to wash and to purge as well, which is the key thing that Yeshua 
is saying there to those who are mature to receive it. But let's go to First John chapter, um, First John chapter one again, seven to ten. First John chapter one, seven to ten, right? First John chapter one, seven to ten. So here we go, right here. And we'll go, we're going over what we had touched on before. We're going to go over this again, 7 to 10. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christus, his son, cleanseth us, I and I, from all sin. Now the fact of indwelling sin is admitted here. If we say that we have no sin... Like some folks try to say, well, not me, I'm, I'm, I don't, whatever, I don't do nothing. We deceive ourselves. That's, that's the way you can get the, the mental deception. You know, you get deceived. You get deluded if we say we don't have any sin. And the truth, therefore, the truth is not in us. The truth is not in us. That's very interesting that, that if we say we have sin and recognize that it's in us, then the truth is in us. But if we say we don't have any sin then we are deluding ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, sins confess, forgiven, and cleanse. You know what I'm saying? If we confess our sins, he is what? Yatamana. He is faithful and he is just. In other words, he is righteous to forgive I and I, I and I sins, I and I shortcomings, and to cleanse us. You know what I'm saying? Spiritually, metaphysically, from all unrighteousness, from everything that puts us out of conformity with his will, the will which we must make our wills obedient to. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, if we say, well, no, not me, I haven't done nothing, we make him a liar. So if we say that, like, yes, I'm not a Rastafari, and we can't admit our shortcomings, then we make... His majesty a liar will make Yeshua a liar. And his word, therefore, that, that, that saying, if we say, it confesses that his word is not in us. And that kind of, once again, brings us to the Isaiah chapter 8 part. You understand? I mean, if they speak not according to this word, you understand? If they speak not according to this, it's, it's because there's no light in them. They are of darkness. They have no light in them. So what is it to walk in the light? You understand? Know what, what does it mean to walk in the light? All things are made manifest by the light. The presence of Jah, the presence of Elohim, it brings the consciousness of sin in the nature and the sins in the, in the life, in the life. Right now, to walk in the light is to frankly confess both. If one is really walking in God's light, one can be quite honest and frank in confessing, confessing and recognizing those things. So that's, that's what leads one to growth. It's like in gardening, if you prune, you know, if you prune certain of, of your vines or, 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 or the various different agricultures, you prune it, it helps the growth even more. But if you leave that via, that hinders you will send the growth. So when Christ said, if I tell you natural things, earthly things, and you don't get them, how can you understand the supernatural, the spiritual things? So we have a reflection, almost like Old Testament to New Testament, of that very principle right there. So the, it's the blood of Yeshua, the life of Christos, the life of the Moshiach, is the divine provision. In other words, it's that life of Christ symbolized by the blood that is that divine provision, provisio, right? In the cross, in the mezcal, chatiyat, or sin, was condemned, according to Romans uh, 8 and 3, and sin was put away, chatiyat, that original sin, that ignorance, was put away, Hebrews 9 and 26. Now, in the light, the barhan, the barhanu, it means the acknowledgement. So when it says to walk in the light, what does it mean? To walk in that acknowledgement of these facts. 
So we're learning these facts, but now we have to walk in acknowledgement of these facts that we have learned and that we acknowledge. And it's also the imnet or the faith, the true faith in Moshiach, the true faith in the Moshiach crucified as that remedy. The crucifixion part of his manifestation is the remedy now for our shortfalls, our a guilty consciousness, our lack of, a lack of the overcoming of those evils, but we have to confess them. We have to recognize, as it says, it's recognize, you understand, these. So, my brothers and sisters, like I said, I wanted to still touch on Miriam's, Miriam's death and also another word on, on the name Mary, you understand, as well as the name Hannah, something very interesting that we... Um, that we had read within uh, within the Gas uh, the, the Ethiopic uh, legends of this uh, Dengel Mariam or Our Lady Mary. We're gonna take a little pause for the cause because the heat wave is kind of going away a little bit, but it's still here, and we're gonna just hydrate. Need to get that that wuha that wuha that water for a moment. So, my brothers and sisters. You know, um, shalom again. Get some water yourselves and, and, and continue to um, receive and drink the water of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, to ever live in life. So shalom and stay tuned.